You know how we always start these deep dives talking about something mind-blowing? Well, buckle up, because today we are diving into entanglement swamping. It really gets you thinking, right? It really does, and especially how it ties into the ER EPR conjecture. Oh, absolutely. Huge implications. And I got to be honest, I am not totally sure I get it. So maybe you can like walk me through it. Okay. So basically the ER EPR conjecture is this wild idea that entanglement, Einstein's spooky action at a distance might actually be the same thing as wormholes. Okay. Wait, you're blowing my mind right now. Yeah. Are we saying that we could create mini wormholes by messing with these entangled particles? Well, it is a bold idea for sure, but that is what this proposal is suggesting. They want to use this thing called QShad code, which is like a quantum programming language to like manipulate these entangled particles. They're not just observing them anymore. They're actually like rearranging these connections. Exactly. Imagine you've got two pairs of entangled particles, right? Like two sets of letters that are magically linked. Entanglement swapping. It's like shuffling those letters around, performing a specific quantum operation, and boom, you end up with a new connection between letters that were never linked before. Okay. That is wild. So how do they actually do that? Like, what is this quantum operation you are talking about? So that is where this Q-Shark code comes in. It basically lays out the steps for how to manipulate these entangled particles or quibits as they are called using lasers and magnetic fields it's yeah. like a super precise dance to get them in the right spot so they're basically choreographing these tiny particles to create these new connections but how do they even know if it worked how do they check if they successfully like made a mini wormhole well they got to check the results right a q sharp code includes a step where they measure the state of the quibits after they go through this entanglement swapping process and by analyzing the results of those measurements they can determine if those quibits are actually entangled in this new configuration. It's like checking the results of a magic trick, but instead of a rabbit, you get proof of a mini wormhole. It's pretty wild stuff. It is pretty wild, and this is just the first step. We are talking about potentially proving a connection between quantum mechanics and the large-scale structure of space-time itself. Okay, I'm going to need a minute to process that one. So we've got entanglement swapping, we've got these potential mini wormholes, but how do we go from there to actually, like, studying space-time? Like, how do you build a model of the universe out of these tiny entangled particles? That's where it gets really interesting. This proposal goes beyond just swapping entanglement. They want to actually use these quibits to simulate a simplified model of space-time itself. Wait, simulate space-time with quibits. What does that even look like? Okay, so picture a grid, right, like a chessboard. Each square on that board represents a quibit. Now, some of these squares are connected by lines, and those lines represent entanglement between the quibits. So this grid of quibits with its entanglement connections, it's like a mini simplified version of space-time, like a quantum map of the universe. Precisely. And by studying how changes to the entanglement pattern on this quibit grid affect the overall structure, the researchers hope to learn something about how entanglement and the fabric of space-time are related. So they're basically creating a miniature universe inside a quantum computer and then poking and prodding it to see how it reacts. You got it. The idea is to manipulate the entanglement on this quibit grid, see if those manipulation, those changes in connection actually translate into changes in the distance between the quibits as defined by their model of space-time. Okay, I have to admit that is mind-blowing. We're talking about potentially manipulating the fabric of space-time itself using entangled particles. But before we dive into that, I have a question about this distance you mentioned. If we're saying that stronger entanglement equals closer proximity in this model, how do you actually measure that? Well, that is where things get really interesting from a quantum information perspective. They're proposing using some specific measures of entanglement like negativity and concurrence. Negativity and concurrence. Wow. Those sound pretty intense for just measuring distance. They are, but they're crucial for understanding how strong the entanglement between these qubits actually is. Think of them as tools that allow us to quantify how strongly two qubits are entangled, which gives us a sense of their distance within this model. So if two entangled particles are really closely connected, their negativity and concurrence scores would be like off the charts. And if they are more like distant acquaintances, those scores would be lower, like a quantum friendship meter. Uh-huh, you could say that. It's a way to quantify the strength of that quantum link. These measures will be essential for analyzing how changes in entanglement might translate into changes in the perceived distance between qubits in their model. This is incredible. We're talking about creating a mini universe of entangled particles and then measuring their friendship to see if it affects the fabric of space-time itself. But I have a confession. I'm a visual learner. 
Is there any way to actually see what's happening with this entanglement swapping and space-time warping? You're in luck because the proposal actually talks about using some cool visualization tools like GraphViz and NetworkX to represent the whole system. Imagine a network of points, each representing a quibit, and lines between them representing the entanglement. As the experiment unfolds, those lines will be constantly forming, breaking, and reforming, creating a dynamic visual representation of the entanglement swapping process. It's like a cosmic light show, where the connections themselves are the stars. I can't wait to see what patterns emerge. Okay, so we've talked about the how of this proposal, but what exactly are they hoping to find? What's the ultimate goal of all this entanglement swapping and space-time simulating? Yeah, they're definitely looking for patterns relationships, like in that <laughs> network of entangled quibits. Right. The big question is, does changing how entangled those quibits are actually change the distance between them, you know? Okay, so like if they strengthen the entanglement between two quibits, crank up the volume on that quantum friendship meter, are they saying the distance between them in this model would decrease? Exactly. It'd be like creating a shortcut. And if they can show that manipulating entanglement directly impacts the distance between quibits in their model, well, that would really support the idea that entanglement might actually be the mechanism behind wormholes. Just like the EPR conjecture proposes. Exactly. That's insane. So they're not just making these mini wormholes. They're trying to map out the rules, yeah. the geometry of this entanglement-driven space-time. Yeah, it's like they're charting a new kind of map, not of physical space, but of the connections themselves. So instead of stars and planets, they're mapping the relationships between these entangled particles, right. trying to decipher the underlying structure of space-time itself. It's like trying to understand the fundamental language of the universe. And the key to understanding that language, to reading that map, is by measuring those subtle changes in negativity and concurrence. Yeah, as they're tweaking the entanglement between these qubits, it's like each experiment is a conversation of back and forth with the very fabric of reality. And that signal, that pattern could be the key to finally understanding this crazy connection between entanglement and space-time. It's like we're on the verge of unlocking one of the universe's greatest secrets. It's definitely a possibility. And the implications are huge. But even if this specific proposal doesn't answer everything, it's a huge step forward in understanding quantum gravity and the nature of reality. This is why I love these deep dives. We get to explore these groundbreaking ideas, these potential paradigm shifts, and who knows, maybe even inspire some future Einsteins along the way. Speaking of inspiration, have you considered what a future where we can manipulate space-time might look like? This proposal is focused on the microscopic scale, but what if we could scale it up? Okay, now you're really making me think. What possibilities and challenges might that unlock? Yeah. Yeah, it's really hard to wrap your head around, isn't it? Like, just a few decades ago, this was all science fiction. Right, and now we're talking about using it to reshape the very fabric of space-time. It's like we're not just observing the universe anymore. We're actually, like, I interacting with it at the most fundamental level. And that ability to interact, to manipulate it, brings up a whole new set of questions. Like, what are the ethical implications of all of this? Yeah, that's a good point. It's like that old saying, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Exactly. We need to be very careful when we're messing with the fabric of reality. Mm. Who knows what could happen? Okay, so enough of the scary stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the potential here. I mean, if we can manipulate space-time, even on a tiny scale, imagine what we could do. It's mind-blowing to think about faster-than-light travel, new forms of communication, maybe even the ability to explore parts of the universe that are currently beyond our reach. It's enough to make your head skin. But for now, it seems like those possibilities are still a long way off. Yeah. What are the next steps for the researchers behind this proposal? Yeah. What's going to take to actually make these mini wormholes a reality? Well, first things first, they actually have to do the experiment. The proposal lays out a plan, but actually building a quantum computer that can do this. Implementing the QShog code, collecting yeah. all that data. That's a pretty tall order. It is a huge undertaking. And even then, they have to analyze all of that data, look for those tiny correlations between entanglement and space-time. Like finding a needle in a haystack of quantum noise, right? Pretty much. And right. it won't be easy, but the potential payoff is huge. If they can actually prove that manipulating entanglement affects the distance between those qubits in their simulation, it would be a massive breakthrough. It really would. It would change everything about how we understand the universe and open up a whole new world of possibilities for technology and exploration. This is one of those deep dives that really makes you think about the big questions. Like, if entanglement is the key to unlocking the secrets of space-time, what else might we be able to do with it?
That's the beauty of science, isn't it? Every answer just leads to more questions. Every discovery opens up a whole new world of possibilities. This deep dive has been a fascinating look into the cutting edge of quantum physics, and I, for one, am excited to see where it takes us. Me too. Well, folks, that's all the time we have for today's deep dive into the mind-blowing world of entanglement swapping and the ER EPR conjecture. Until next time, keep those minds curious, and we'll see you on the other side.